Okay, today on Searching for Happy, I'm with my new friend, Charles Patti. And Charles, man, thanks so much for being a part of the podcast. I appreciate you having me. Thanks so much. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about psychedelic med medicines. And one of the things about um, Charles is he works in the field of psychedelic medicines because um, they saved his life. And we're going to get into that story in a bit. But Charles, um, you're the chief educational officer and ambassador for myself wellness which is a, a company that um you started in florida bonita florida correct yeah my fiance christina and i actually started the company and it's because psychedelic medicine saved my life so yeah we do psychedelic ketamine therapy in bonita springs florida and we're having completely amazing results helping people with this medicine so it's really okay. a game for a lot of people okay awesome well let's get into a little bit of your backstory so you know, you, you, you struggled early on and, um, and then you found, um, plant medicine and all of the stuff that's been labeled illegal to be hugely beneficial for you. Yeah. You dabbled in it. it. It, you had a breakthrough, it saved your life. And now all of a sudden FDA is all over fast tracking everything that's been illegal for years. It's absolutely incredible. But tell us a little bit about, you know, what, your struggle was early on and then how you found psychedelics in which psychedelics were really effective in helping you move through that that uh, challenge not for sure so you know my dad died when i was really young i was about like six years old and um and moving forward after that i, I had this you know just the strongest fear of death you could possibly imagine i used to like wake up days and the first thing that would pop in my head would be like am i gonna die today you know, and then moving up, you know, I started going through depression and having anxiety. And at a very, very young age, I actually started medicating with alcohol. Um, I had access to alcohol in the house. And, you know, I'd had a couple sips of alcohol that my family had given me being like, you know, a kid where it's like, you know, you're at the dinner table with your family, like, oh, you're have a sip of wine or whatever. And I felt this sense of relief, like instantly. And I was like, oh, this this is what I need in my life. Like, th this is what's going to make me feel better. This is what's going to take my fear away and complete me. And uh, my, my, you know, moving forward into my, you know, early young teenage years, I started dabbling with cocaine and benzodiazepines like Xanax, uh, pain pills like Percocets and things to that effect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my life just kept spiraling more and more out of control over the years. I, um, you know, I ended up using large amounts of different substances, you know, heroin, cocaine. Uh, and I was, you know, but the, but the truth is, is that no matter what the substance is, because like I was addicted to food, I was addicted to scratch off tickets. I was addicted to women. I was addicted yeah. to anything that would take me outside of myself. And what people, you know, it's like, these are all just symptoms, symptoms of the underlying issue, which was the depression depression, the anxiety, the fear of death, the PTSD that I had gone through. So, you know, or that I was suffering through. So, you know, that's really what I had always resorted to. And um, my life was a train wreck. It was a mess. And it was actually when I had had, uh, this was about 10 years ago, I had a profound experience where I had taken MDMA one night and it was kind of like the perfect storm because after I had taken the MDMA right before I was getting ready to kick in the guy that I was hanging, one of the guys I was hanging out with that night, he handed me a bag of ketamine and he was like, Hey man, you want to try this? And I'm like, what is that ketamine? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, well, yeah. Okay. And right after I did two bumps of the ketamine, the MDMA hit me. And it was like this, the perfect storm of, I stood up in the living room. And I go, man, if I didn't know what the universe was about before, I know what it's about now, man. Mm. Everything's made out of energy. I go, you got positive energy and negative energy. And I'm so full of positive energy. I sat down in the chair. I looked up at the ceiling or no, I looked in front of me and the entire room broke down to like a quantum state. I could see all of the energy, like all of the atoms vibrating and everything. And I just saw that everything was just at different frequencies and densities. I looked up and a geometric portal opened above me on the ceiling. I felt like I was being lowered down in a slingshot and I was skyrocketed out of my body into deep space where 
I, you know, had contact with higher dimensional beings and mm -hmm. Jesus was there. I, you know, listen, I'm not a religious person. I'm yeah. a very spiritual person, but this was just my experience. And telepathically, the message that I got that night was that I was supposed to change my life. I was supposed to stop taking drugs and I was supposed to start, you know, healing myself. So ultimately I could, you know, help other people. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's not how it really happened after that. Uh, yeah. I didn't have anybody to integrate my mm -hmm experience with really and you know it kind of left me feeling more isolated and alone than i did even going into it but die and i dove back into my you know substance abuse and then like through the course of the years i knew that there was something to it especially from that night and mm -hmm. i knew that if i incorporated psychedelics into my life for the therapeutic value and really used them as the tools they were meant to be used as to heal I could really change my life. And I did. So I started, I, you know, I did some macro doses of psilocybin mushrooms, uh, a lot of DMT experiences, um, LSD experiences. And then when we opened up the clinic, I actually had our doctor, Dr. Ferber, put me through the protocol we were going to be giving our clients. And uh, on the intermuscular shots of ketamine, I had more divine experiences. And the ketamine was really the icing on the cake for my hmm. psychedelic journey. I actually haven't done psychedelics in the last two and a half years since I did my ketamine treatments. And the reason was, was just because I got the same message over and over at the end. And it was basically like, all right, you're good now. Now you got to, you know, manifest your own reality, but, you know, build this, build this healing organism to help other people heal. And, and, you know, we, we really haven't looked back since then. So if it wasn't for psychedelic medicines, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you right now. Yeah. That's wow. That's great. That's great. So when you started like doing the the experimenting with macro dosing, and you said you were doing some DMT, yeah, and you had the big breakthrough. You said with MDMA and some ketamine, something. What were the ketamine? Were they pills? No, it was so it was actually powdered ketamine, and and powdered. I powdered. You, know, you, you I snorted it, and like you, you snorted. Know, it. Okay, which, is, which just for all the listeners out there, I, I I do not suggest that people do that. We have access to do it properly in a facility like the one we have now, where you know you don't have to be snorting any kind of white powders out there, and you can do it like you know safely in a sure. in the right environment with a well, team. Well, that was in an era. That was in an era. So you're, I mean, there's a lot of people like I look at as kind of like pioneers, <laughs> really. Yeah. You know, no, I mean, you got and you and you discovered something that that to, created a breakthrough for you, yeah. which you know all of the research um, universities are all over today and FDA, right? No, so it's sure. like so you did um, you did a MDMA and ketamine at the same time. Yeah, that's when you had this kind of really incredible breakthrough well, where you saw like Jesus, this portal. Yeah. I okay. Mean, and then, and then like on a six gram macro dose of mushrooms, like years later, when I was really trying to, you know, take cocaine and alcohol out of the equation of my life, I had always heard Terrence McKenna talk about, you know, take five grams and pitch black silence and meditate on it, you know, secrets of the universe kind of stuff. So I was like, being the overachiever that I was, I was like, you know, I'm going to do six grams. <laughs> and uh, I locked myself in my bedroom and I, I turned off all the lights and I got under my comforter. And I went out of my body again, and I went directly out into the universe where I became one with the universe, and I became one with everything in the universe and everyone in the universe. And then I became one with God, and then I was God. And then I realized that every time that I was taking drugs and alcohol, I was literally poisoning God. And it was one of these shell shocking experiences where when I got back to my body, there was a lot of crying and apologizing that night. And then once I really knew who like, you know, that we were all connected and that we're all extensions of the divine, I figured it would probably be the right idea to start, you know, treating myself accordingly and, you know, change my diet and start exercising and eating healthier and things like that. And like, you know, and then prior to that experience, I had a breakthrough on DMT where I had quit a six year heroin addiction. So, you know, like, like I said, it was like, a, it was, you know, this wasn't like a one and done scenario. It was over the time using things like kind of synchronistically when the universe wanted it to happen. But you know, I'm at a point in my life now where, you know, like, where, well, for years, I never thought that I would not be addicted to some sort of substance. 
I had had, you know, psychiatrists label me with so many different diagnoses. I, you know, I thought that I was going to be on some sort of medication for the rest of my life. And the truth is, is like, I don't take any drugs or alcohol anymore. I don't take any medications. I have an amazing quality of life. And like, now I have a company and, and like, you know, a, a beautiful family. I have a three, a three-year-old son, you know, all of these things that I never thought that I would have in my life. And it's as a direct result of these amazing, beautiful healing medicines. Wow. That is so that's that's awesome, man. Thanks. Man. Wow. Talking about coming through going through the darkness and coming through the, you know, through through it, ending yeah. in the other end, man. That's that's terrific. So um for the people that are are viewing the this podcast, let's go through some of the psychedelics that you mentioned. So you mentioned DMT, I think, yeah. right? DMT. Yeah. yeah. There's ketamine, there's psilocybin. Yep. Um there's um mdma yeah they're all psychedelics yeah the only one that's approved right now by well, fda is ketamine well, so ketamine's not classified as a psychedelic okay so ketamine is actually a dissociative anesthetic. right and and it was actually fda approved as an anesthetic in 1970 right okay is, is that it's giving people at the right doses, especially through intermuscular shots of the medicine, some of the most profound psychedelic experiences a human being could ever possibly imagine having. I, I tell people an intermuscular shot of ketamine at the right dose is like an hour long DMT trip. You mm -hmm. know, we're like at our clinic, like we have people that say they sit with angels during their treatments. Mm -hmm. We have people that go down to oneness with the universe. Sometimes yeah. people have divine experiences where they say they, you know, they're in the presence of God. Sometimes yeah. people say they speak with deceased relatives during their treatments. Sure. But uh, it works on the serotonin receptors. I mean, no, it works on the NMDA receptors in the brain, while typically psychedelic compounds or hallucinogens work on the serotonin receptors in the brain. Okay. So let's break these down. So there's DMT. Yep. For the people that, you know, are really interested in exploring this option, there's a lot we know, in, especially in our society in the United States, there's there's millions and millions of people on medications for um, bipolar, PTSD, depression, anxiety, and they've been doing it for years. And now we're, we're seeing that uh, we're, people are reading and hearing about all of the, the, the powerful results uh, and findings in these these studies through NYU and Johns Hopkins. And, uh, you know, so let's break it down and help the viewers understand what are, are the differences in these? What is what is DMT? What is ketamine? What is psilocybin? There's all you know, there's these others like uh, what peyote? Um, yeah, you know, I did. You know, the I did the five MEO DMT um, podcast, and uh, that's that come that's from an extract of of a venom from a frog. Yeah, the so, but what can, help us understand what are the differences in these? So the 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 DMT that I actually was talking about with all my experiences is something called NNDMT, and it's actually extracted from a root bark called Mimosa hostilis. And um, it's, it's basically, you know, it's DMT is in almost every living thing, you know, on the, on the planet, but, uh, but it's been very high quantities in MHRB or Mimosa hostilis root bark, and you can extract it out, which is not the 5-MeO DMT or Bufo, the one that comes off of the, to, out of the back of the toad through the venom. And um, that's a, the, the NN DMT is like a 15 to 20 minute long trip. Um, that being said, it's, one of the most profound experiences that you could ever possibly imagine having it's uh and and dmt is that different than what is does ayahuasca have dmt so so ayahuasca does contain dmt but okay. it's but it's 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 just it's from another it's from another um plant it's okay. not from the bufo uh, frog okay all right so then we have the the acting ingredient in psilocybin and mushrooms is, is psilocybin right it's yeah or psilocin psilocin and and and, and so psilocybin mushrooms you know this is like a four to six hour trip depending on the dose um you, you might even me maybe less at times but um you know around you people are, are micro dosing mushrooms which is anywhere from like 0.25 to 0.5 grams of mushrooms uh this is like having very you know profound antidepressant effects on people 
um, people would be, you know, can take like up to a gram of mushrooms and, and really, you know, process some things or have some breakthroughs, but a three gram mushroom trip would be a therapeutic dose of mushrooms. Okay. Uh, this, this is when people are really like starting to have, you know, profound healing experiences. And then you would have a macro dose of mushrooms, which would be five and above. And, you know, this is like, where people are, you know, having these, it's basically like a death and rebirth kind of scenario where, you know, you become one with the universe and you become everything. And then you go back to your body and realize that, you know, we're all it. <laughs> yeah. So if you do a three gram dose of mushroom and that's a therapeutic dose, yeah. what, what there's so many different types of mushrooms out there. So there's like the, the golden teachers, I guess there's a penis envy, which I've heard yep. it's really powerful, but there's, yeah. there's stuff coming out of the Amazon. Yeah. What's the difference in those? So it, it, honestly, the one thing that's hard about mushrooms is, is like you like you said, like I did the six gram penis envy trip, which is a very strong uh, strain of mushrooms. Mm -hmm. But that being said, though, the one of the things with nature is like it's never going to be consistent. You know, so like you might have, you know, like, you know, one trip with one kind of mushroom and then a month later you get the same kind of mushrooms, you take the same amount and you might not have as much of a profound experience because there might have been actually less psychoactive components or like the amount of it in it. Um, this is like one reason why, like, I'm a big fan of ketamine for what we do with it because it's consistent every time mm -hmm. so like you so it's it, it's you know and listen like i know there's a lot of people out there that are like listen i'm all natural natural I like entheogenic medicines plant medicines and i get it and like and i'm a complete advocate listen i live a holistic type lifestyle we are a holistic type wellness center that uses ketamine therapy to get people off of their pharmaceutical medications but the thing is is that you're always going to know what you're getting because it's made in a lab and we're talking about like salts and minerals ketamine is actually one of the safest least toxic anesthetics on the market it's so safe that they use it on children one and a half and older for surgeries uh, some people will be like isn't that for horses or don't they give that to horses as a tranquilizer and the answer is yes they do but they use it on animals because of its safety profile and and like that it's the one of the least toxic anesthetics on the market mm -hmm. cats for instance if you give them any other kind of anesthetic it would kill them but ketamine won't kill the cat uh, they also use it like in the emergency room for people that are overdosing on opiates that are combative because, combative because it doesn't have, it's not a respiratory suppressant. So you can like, it's not going to affect your breathing. And, uh, you know, to be completely honest, out of all of the psychedelic compounds that I used to heal, and I used pretty much all of them. What the ketamine did for me that the other ones didn't was it took the peaks and valleys away from my mood. The depression was gone. The anxiety was gone. I wasn't white knuckling it anymore because like, you know, from not taking substances because I had got, it really got to the root issues of why I was suffering to begin with. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, I have hundreds of psychedelic experiences under my belt from over the years, but the ketamine was the end of it for me because, you know, as, as Alan Watts said, you know, like psychedelics are like a telephone receiver. You pick the receiver up, you put it to your ear, you listen to the message, but it's always important to remember to put the receiver back down and apply what you've learned to your life. Mm. And that was the message I got the last couple of times on ketamine was like, listen, anything after this would be more recreational for you. You got what you needed from it. Okay. So Charles, so, so it sounds like after all of the, the work that you did and all the exploration with um, a variety of these different psychedelics. Once you tapped into ketamine, would you say that was the ideal psychedelic there? Or, I, you know, people, I, I'm calling it a psychedelic, and I've heard yeah. the term disassociative, um, yeah. uh, but medicine, but I mean, is that, was that the game changer for you, ketamine? I'll tell you this, you know, like, in the, I had this conversation with somebody at Microdose the other day. All medicines have their value. There's none that I don't think that are like, you know, better and worse than others. For my personal journey, though, ketamine was the game changer. For and you. Like, if, not just for me, though. It's what I watch on a daily basis at our facility. I mean, like, yeah. you know, like, we have people that serve medicine for a living. And I'm talking about like ayahuasca and stuff like that. And they'll come and do treatments at our facility. And through the process of their ketamine treatments, it heals something that the ayahuasca hadn't reached. You know, the, the magic about disassociation is it's when the mind separates from the body and it resets your nervous system. But we're taught and we're programmed 
don't show any emotions. Emotions make you weak. Just keep moving forward. And that's not how we're supposed to live as human beings. So we have a tendency to stuff things and repress them. Sometimes we don't even know that we're stuffing and repressing them in our subconscious. And when you get into a disassociated state, it takes the blocks down and it allows these things to process, release and let go. So mm -hmm. like in my personal opinion, I think that ketamine is probably one of the most important tools that we have, not only because it's FDA approved and you can have legal access to it right now, but like, and listen, like I know, like I'm a fan of all of them, but I tell people all the time, even if none of the other ones went through FDA approval, we have this one and the efficacy is so unbelievable. It's almost like we really don't even need the other ones. You know, I mean, but of course I'm a big supporter of all of them and I used all of them, but there's just something very magical about what the ketamine is doing for people. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you see, do you think that there is something um, unique and special that separates ketamine apart from the others? Or is it, or is it like an SSRI? People have to sample it and Zoloft works for one. Paxil will work for you. Prozac works for you. And you got to sample them all to figure out which one is most effective for you and your chemistry or your makeup. Do you think yeah. that's what it is or? Yeah, no, I, and I, I definitely agree with that. You know, like some people, psilocybin might be better than ketamine. The thing that ketamine is doing in such an amazing way, though, is like whenever we've had any kind of traumatic experiences in our life or just through the course of life, our neural pathways get damaged in our brain. And when the neurons are trying to flow through these pathways, they start to bounce off the walls, which can cause depression, anxiety, PTSD, and a string of other things. Mm -hmm. Ketamine is going in and physiologically remapping and restructuring the neural pathways in the brain, mm -hmm. causing new neuroplasticity or new neural connections in the brain. It's actually sprouting new dendrites off these yes. pathways, which is causing new neural connections. It's also increasing the natural production of dopamine in the brain. Dopamine is our feel-good chemical. It's what motivates us to get out of the bed in the morning and, and go out and try to accomplish our dreams. So the thing is, is that in conjunction with the physiological healing to the neural pathways, increased dopamine levels, and then these profound psychedelic experiences or these therapeutic dreamlike states that people are going into, you're talking about a trifecta of action here that is really just propelling people forward in their healing journey, like, you know, exponentially faster than other modalities are out there. That also being said, though, and I want this to be really clear, I'm not just sitting here telling everybody that the medicine's the answer. The medicine's not the answer. The medicine's a tool. It's a catalyst. What we teach people about in My Self Wellness is meditation, breath work, healthy lifestyle changes, all of the things that are the real recipe for long-term success with the medicine. Because as cliche as it sounds, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So you'll feel so much better from the treatments, but if you go live back to living the same kind of unhealthy lifestyle you were living before, you're going to regress. You know, the thing is, is that, um, no, that, that's basically, that's basically the message. Yeah. Did you see that recent, uh, recent podcast or not a podcast? It was a, a, a PBS documentary on psilocybin. Yeah. So and my buddy, my buddy, Dr. Albert Garcia, who's actually doing studies with psilocybin at, uh, Johns Hopkins university was in that. So oh, yeah. was he? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So they, they, basically everything that you just shared about um, ketamine yeah. is exactly what they're explaining that psilocybin does in the yeah. findings that, that reconnecting the, the, the kind of the areas of the brain that aren't kind of transmitting together. It's called, you yeah. know, that neuroplasticity type aspect is going on with, I, I guess the mushrooms as well. And, um, and they, sure. And they believe that's some of the same things that's happening with uh, like ayahuasca and LSD. Now yeah. we're not talking a lot about LSD yet, but I hear they're doing a lot of research with that as well. So LSD is an amazing healing compound. You know, listen, like a lot of people don't realize this, but the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson, he actually used LSD in his own healing journey. Uh, they seem to leave that out of the literature, but it's the truth. Bill actually had a, he was in detox and he had a, 
uh, white light experience, this spiritual awakening. And it was actually due to a belladonna extract that they had given him. And he mm -hmm. saw visions of the future and the society of alcoholics helping each other stay sober. And then 20 years into Bill's own recovery, he used LSD to heal his own depression. So Bill actually wanted to incorporate LSD into the 12 steps as the 13th step for a true spiritual mm -hmm. awakening. But you know, they were having amazing results with LSD in the 50s and 60s yes. for alcohol. They were using it for AUD or alcohol use disorder, having phenomenal results with this medicine. Um, what ended up happening was very unfortunate, though, was, uh, you know, Richard Nixon came through and it was around the time of the Vietnam War. And, you know, unfortunately for the people that were taking LSD, they didn't want to go to war anymore. And then this yeah. is this showed to be a very big problem with the narrative that was going on at that time. So Nixon went and made LSD and all other hallucinogens schedule one drugs, which means that there's no therapeutic value to the medicines and that they shouldn't even be researched anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and, but the truth is though, it's like ketamine is doing amazing things for AUD also. There's a company called Awaken Sciences out of Canada, and they did a study with AUD where they had taken people, you know, listen, if people go to a detox day, 28 day stay in rehab, 12 step meetings for the rest of their life, there's around a three to 5% chance of long-term sobriety. After the study they did with ketamine and AUD out of uh, Awaken, after six months, 86% of the participants hadn't had one sip of alcohol. They did another, uh, a Russian scientist did a uh, ketamine study with opiate addicts too, like heroin addicts. And uh, they got 78% after six months. So mm -hmm. like when you want to talk about this completely changing the game for the recovery community, these compounds are going to be so incredibly valuable to help save lives because we're in the middle of a mental health crisis. We're in the middle of an opioid epidemic. And like, honestly, there's nothing, you know, I know it works. I, I hear people talk about it and there's like a lot of speculation or whatever, but like I'm a walking, standing, breathing testimonial that this stuff most definitely works. I quit a six year heroin addiction like that. Like mm -hmm. I had my DMT experience. I had a profound experience. The next day I took a couple of Suboxone over to my mother's house. I locked myself in a corner bedroom for a week, detoxed myself, and I was done with heroin. And mm -hmm. like I could not stop before that. But I actually set the intention before I smoked the DMT that night. Mm -hmm. I'm smoking this with the intention of quitting using heroin because I don't want to do this anymore. And just like that, it happened. Your intention when you when you first started that was like, I want to stop using heroin yeah it was as clear as that just this very specific intention i was done man like i wanted to it just it just had like these like you know eagle talons in me where like i just couldn't break free of it but like the, but the dmt it completely changed that man and it was like it gave me the the courage and the strength to actually detox myself off it and get away from it yeah yeah wow let's talk about um so we were on, we were, we were talking about ketamine, how that's really been a, a major um, uh, medicine that's helped you significantly. The one thing that I've heard a little bit about ketamine, and I haven't heard it about any other um, psychedelic that's being explored in the labs right now to be approved, but it, the, the memory issue thing that I've heard people talk about taking ketamine where they've had some memory con issues and they, they can't recall things. What what are your thoughts on that? And what have you do you what have you seen? Do you mean like during an actual experience? It's been it's been after the experience where they'll go in for um correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're on a regiment for like a week or something where they go in and they're doing an IV and they they and then they come out and they have issues recalling information or completely just have memory issues, remembering certain things. Um, that would be new to me. I haven't like, like, honestly, like none of our clients, we've done thousands of treatments in our facility. I've, I've never heard anything like that. I mean, when ketamine, ketamine is an anesthetic by trade. So like if people are overdosing, people on ketamine, they won't remember anything from it because it's, it's like, you know, it's basically like going in for a surgery. You don't remember the surgery. It would sure. be like that kind of thing. But um, when we're doing, we do mostly intermuscular shots of the medicine in our facility. Our protocol is two treatments a week over a three-week period or one treatment a week over a six-week period. We do six treatments. Um, 
we're doing sub anesthetic doses of the medicine. So like, this is like a fraction of what you'd actually be giving somebody going into surgery. We okay. want you to remember the actual whole, whole experience. And, um, as far as maybe like if people are abusing ketamine or something like that, maybe that could, but I've like actual in clinic treatment. I, I had never heard of anything. Never like heard that. of it. How do you yeah. guys administer? Is it administered by like an IV? No. So, so we do, so we do offer IV ketamine. Um, like what I was saying is we do mostly intramuscular shots or IM shots of the medicine. And the reason is, is be, and you know, there's a lot of, uh, controversy in the field where, you know, like, which is the best way to administer the medicine. And I don't think it's a best way. I think that there's just different pro different, different situations where maybe different protocols might be more, you know, uh, beneficial for certain people. But when you're talking about psychedelic ketamine therapy, intramuscular shots are really the way to go, in my opinion, just because instead of all of the medicine being dripped over a 45 minute period through an IV. And we're talking about, you know, the, the therapeutic value of the medicine and these psychedelic experiences happen when you're in a disassociated state, mm -hmm. when you do an IM shot of the medicine, the medicine hits your whole, it all hits your system within like 10 minutes. And this is what's like, you know, blasting people into these profound healing, you know, so uh, that medicine. yeah, Charles, that, that process that you're, you're describing inner mus muscle, what is this? What is that? So it's basically like, um, like it's an intermuscular shot. So it's a shoulder shot. You just load it okay. up into an actual syringe and you just inject it into somebody's shoulder rather than le letting it drip in an IV over a 45 minute period. Okay. And, you know, like I said, we offer both, uh, we offer both ways where, you know, we're really here to empower and assist people on their healing journey. So we're never going to tell them what's best for them we can just make suggestions but we're finding that the intermuscular shots are having a truly profound impact on people's life um, we've had people that'll go do iv ketamine therapy at a different clinic and then they come and they do our im or intermuscular shot protocol and they're just like what was that like okay that's completely different than what i experienced at the last place you know this is when people are having these divine experiences or these just profound mind-blowing psychedelic experiences so once they do once you do the shot in your clinic do people have to stay there for a while um so 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 like what would happen is is like we have our own personalized rooms uh you know it's like a recliner style chair it's not like a doctor's office or a medical facility i mean it is a medical facility but it feels like you're at a day spa um our nursing staff comes in they take your blood pressure they take your vitals administer some blood pressure medication or you know and 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 make sure everything's going accordingly they go in administer the medicine and then the trip or the session lasts for about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, they have time to integrate back after their experience in the room. So we have a little bit of extra time blocked off in the room. But we also built our company on a lot of what not to do's. And we had heard at, at other clinics, people were being rushed out after their treatments were over. And like, you know, the physiological healing to the neuropathways is supposedly happening for like, you know, the hour you're in your session and then hours after following the session. So you're literally like reprogramming your mind to feel the way that you do coming out of these sessions. So we didn't want to be rushing people out while they were still disoriented from the medication. So Christina, my better half uh, has, you know, built the most beautiful integration room with couches and diffusers and meditation music and things like that. So people can get done with their treatments and then go relax in our integration room and keep on integrating and meditating after their experiences. Okay, great. That's awesome. So, and, and so getting back to, ketamine as a as a the the um medicine that you've used to 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 get you to where you're at today is is it something that you have to continuously do charles is there a regiment that you got to follow do you got to take it every once in a month or every three months every week just to to really sustain um the, the stability that you now have in your life so i haven't done a ketamine treatment in over two and a half years man Wow. Um, listen, like, this is what I tell people. And like, like, I'm not like saying anything's better than anything. I'm just giving examples of what's like, you know, working well for us the way we do it and what's worked for me in my own personal journey. But the thing is, is that my belief 
is that when you're running a low dose IV, you're giving people the antidepressant effects of the medicine. Okay. And like, this is where people are going to have to continue doing ketamine treatments for long periods of time. Even though the dosing protocol that we use being a psychedelic dosing protocol at our facility, it's a micro dose in ketamine compared to an anesthetic dose. But when you're talking about psychedelic experiences, it's a macro dose in psychedelic experience. So like, we're not just scratching the surface at our facility. A lot of our clients will do the six sessions and they're great. It's a complete game changer, like, you know, like a night and day scenario. Do we have clients that want to continue in on their healing journey and keep on learning about themselves in the universe? Sure. So we also do offer that. But the reason that I got into this field isn't because I wanted to sell ketamine treatments to people. I got into this field because I'm an empath and I didn't want anybody to have to feel the way that I felt for the majority of my life because there's no way for a human being to have to live. So we do not shortchange people on the medicine. We don't shortchange people on the experience. We have other um, you know, services like psychiatry and medical cannabis referrals and IV nutritional therapies and NAD and things like that, where we can get more reoccurring revenue from. Um, I tell our clients, if I see you at the grocery store, or if we go to dinner, or I have a biweekly support group that we do and we offer for our clients or for people that are just looking to grow spiritually, that's where I want to see you. I don't want to see you in here relying on ketamine for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, how these psychedelics are having such a breakthrough on, 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 on some people? And it is a good percentage of people, but then there's another percentage of people that aren't experiencing that same benefit. And so my, I guess my question is, Charles, I, the, you you did, clearly had a mindset that you were done. Do you believe that the people that are having these absolute incredible breakthroughs with psychedelics, I mean, people that have been depressed, PTSD issues, addiction issues, and all of a sudden they're, they're doing these studies at Johns Hopkins and they no longer have any symptoms. It goes completely into remission. It sounds like you had a similar experience, but is there... Do you, do you think that there's something different about you maybe in your mindset or in these people that are having that experience? You know, intention has a lot to do with these medicines. Okay. It's like, even the way that you were taking them, like, like, like when I used to take psychedelics, when I was younger, I was looking to trip. I was looking to have a good time. I wanted to have, you know, party. And that's exactly what I got from the medicine, you know? And then once I used them for the therapeutic value and set the intention of really wanting to heal, that's exactly what I got out of it. You know, the thing is, is that, and just so you know, like at our facility, we have around the 90 percentile success rate of getting people off of all their pharmaceutical medications. We just got one guy off of nine different medications, uh, street drugs, alcohol, like fentanyl, you name it, we're getting people off of everything. Um, you know, the thing is, though, is like, and like, this is going to be a, a, a hard truth for some people to swallow, but sometimes people identify with their trauma so much that it's scary for them to heal it because it's what they identify as. And I'm like, mm -hmm. it's like, I am my trauma. This is what makes me who I am. And then all of a sudden you start to heal that up a little bit and then they don't keep pushing forward or moving forward the way that they really need to, to continue to get to the, where they need to get in the healing process. Because once you take that away, then it takes away their whole identity. That, that's interesting. I've heard that before identifying with the trauma and, and they just, and it's a part of their identity and you can't let go. What's the trick though. I mean, for, for people that are in that place and they can't let it go, what do they need to do to let this, it go? This is going to sound really cliche, but let go is the way, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, like, it's like, see, listen, man, we are all one. This is my belief. All right. That everything's connected. We're one consciousness. And that basically like, you know, and that consciousness could have a lot of uh, names, labels that's put on it, what you want to call it, the universe or God or whatever you want to call it. The truth is, is that like Charles is just a concept. 
Okay. Like there is no Charles, like, like me, identify self-identification is the root of all human suffering. Meaning I am Charles and I'm 40 years old and I was a drug addict most of my life. And I went through all these traumatic things and stuff like that. And to actually take, get into meditation, really become the observer. And like meditation isn't a doing, it's a happening. So like you should almost try to be in a meditative state for most of your day and watching everything play out because this is a movie of the mind it's a movie of the collective mind of god or whatever you want to call it or whatever you want to label it so like once you can really get in tune with like i'm just watching all of this play out things start to become easier but i i truly believe that meditation is the way to get get through all of this and really get to that point you know and like that's what ketamine and psychedelics are. It's a chemically induced meditation at the deepest level possible. Yes. You know, I mean? like, and I think meditation's always been the answer in my life. The problem is, is that I was getting into these deep transits, like these meditative states by taking benzodiazepines and heroin and alcohol and all this. It was just another way to shut off my mind. But these are low vibrational compounds with no therapeutic value to it, really. That's just like, you know, sticking. A bit. It, it was just masking what the underlying issues were, where psychedelic compounds get to the root of these issues. And if you use it in, with the right intention and with good people to guide you, you know, like good people to talk you through these things, help you integrate your experiences, really hold your hand through the process that's also the recipe for long-term success. Yeah, that's that could definitely be beneficial. So getting to the root cause, the, these are um, these are medicines that, that help people get to the root cause. Yeah. So it goes against the complete premise of CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy because cognitive behavioral therapy, which is classified as the most effective and successful therapy to treat anxiety, depression, um, PTSD. Uh, but it's, it's really, it, it's about not worrying about, it's not worrying about what happened or what the cause was. It's about identifying irrational beliefs um, and irrational ideas that come from your core belief system and restructuring them and rewriting them and reminding yourself to rewrite them. But are you saying that psychedelic, the psychedelic approach is really going deep to, to it, to really clearly understand what the cause was to your addiction, what the cause was to your anxiety, what the cause was, because there are people and there are, I mean, there are major thought leaders that are famous that believe, you know, people are innately born with you know, certain predispositions like depression, anxiety, you're born with it. It's innate. So it's, it's, I mean, they, they say the same thing about alcoholism and addiction too, though. And, you know, and the truth is, is like, I think, like I said, this is just a symptom of underlying trauma, underlying issues. You know, it's like, I don't identify as an alcoholic or a drug addict anymore. You don't, I can, I don't even think about doing that stuff anymore. You mm -hmm. couldn't pay me to do it. You know what I'm saying? But like, you know, what what psychedelic compounds did for me and like honestly this is a true statement probably more than anything was they gave me the ability to love myself enough to stop doing what i was doing hmm. i hated myself for so many years i couldn't even look in the mirror at times and you know like once i realized that we were all connected and that i was it and that you know what and that was liberating in itself too because then i didn't take things so personally anymore sure you know listen like I'm friends with a, a cop and he's a guy I work out with. And uh, years ago I had gotten into trouble and he was actually the one that arrested me. And we were working out a couple months ago and he looks at me during the workout and he's like, Charles, he's like, look at you, man. He's like, <laughs> he's like, look at how much you've accomplished in such a short period of time in your life. He's like, don't you wish you wouldn't have screwed up for like 20 something years or whatever. He's like, imagine what you'd be doing now. And I looked at him and I go, Frank, I said, listen, man, if I didn't go through everything that I went through, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. I yeah. said, in actuality, I wouldn't trade a second of the misery for anything. You know what? What we have to understand is that like 
life is a dark to light scenario, you know, and it's the journey, man. You know, it's like if every day was rainbows and unicorns and, and stuff like that, like we wouldn't appreciate anything. We have to go through what we go through to get to where we're at. The thing is, is that we just can't hold on to that stuff. Like, you know, like for so many years, I used to look up and I'd be like high on drugs and I want to quit so badly. And I'd be like, God, why are you doing this to me? You know, like, like, why can't I get my life together? How come I'm so different? And everybody else seems to be living these normal lives. Like, why are you doing this to me? And like, I look at it now and I'm like, aha, like, I get it. Like, you know, like I went through drug addiction, alcohol issues. Uh, I weighed almost 300 pounds in my life from food addictions, uh, scratch off ticket addictions, sex addictions. And see, the truth is, is that there aren't too many people on this planet that are suffering that I can't relate to nowadays. So like mm -hmm. I went through, I'm, I'm purely convinced that I went through everything that I went through to bring me to exactly where I'm at. Where today. you're at. Yeah. And yeah I, so, I totally agree. You know, so it's like, so that's where I'm talking about like, with the whole identification of things. See, I'm not identifying or even like, like me getting caught up in that loop of like, oh, that was so unfair or whatever. We might not be able to understand why we're going through things, why we're going, while we're going through them. But in the future, you will look back and you'll be like, oh, I get it now. Okay. Like that's why I went through that. Cause now I get to use it for a positive, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, I don't know. I'm a big believer in that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. That's uh well said, man. Well said. Um, let's, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, intention setting. Yeah. Because I think when people start to, to um, try um, a psychedelic, um, a psychedelic uh, uh, approach, therapeutic approach that way, it's, very clear that you need to set intentions. And I think intentions need to be clear. So for for the viewers out there, what is a clear intention? You know, like, it's funny, because with all other psychedelic compounds, I think intentions are very important. I think with ketamine, it is important, but ketamine kind of just gives you what you need and not what you ask for. Um, <laughs> but uh going into these like like me setting the intention to quit doing the heroin before i did my dmt experience like you know like you have to think that there's a higher power whatever label that you want to put on it that that's you know conjuring things to happen or unfold the way that they do so if i say a prayer or if i just talk to universe or god or whoever i talk to when i'm praying or talking um and set the intention of listen like I really want to help move past this traumatic experience, or I really want to find that love for myself that I've been lacking for so long. And if you go into it with the intention and you ask to experience that during these psychedelic experiences, mm -hmm. a lot of the time you will receive that during your actual trip or your, your therapeutic experience. So setting intention, the people that you're with is very important because everything is made of energy. Okay. And like, this is my belief, but this is what I preach. And if you are taking a psychedelic compound for a therapeutic value and the person that's out, that is there with you looking after you, and they're not there for the right intention, if they're not there to really help you heal and they're not an empath, their energy can throw off the actual experience. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, so make sure that you're in a very safe place, you know, like I, I really just promote doing this stuff in facilities now because you have legal access or you can get into clinical studies and stuff like that. Um, I didn't have those options, so I did take it in other ways, but setting, make sure you're safe, make sure you're looked after, set the right intentions, make sure you go into it, respect the medicine, take what you're supposed to take and don't get crazy with it. You know, things to that effect are definitely going to, um, it's going to change the outcome of your actual experience. Mm-hmm. What would you say for people that struggle with sleep, chronic insomnia? Ketamine. I'm telling you. But what like, is it? What is a good way? What's an, an intention? What could be to, <laughs> just help me sleep better? 
No, no, because like usually the sleep stuff has to do with other underlying issues, high anxiety levels. I mean, and also too, like, you know, like how much caffeine am I consuming? Uh, you know, like, am I on a string of other medications that might be interrupting my sleep? Like when I used to take copious amounts of Xanax, I could never sleep, you know, I'd be like, unless I dozed off and passed out from the Xanax. But once you actually clear yourself out from all of those kind of other compounds and give yourself time, your body will start to reset itself. Um, one natural supplement that I did take for a while uh, when I was beginning my healing journey because I couldn't sleep was um, fashion, uh, passion flower extract. It was like a pill and that will help. But, you know, the truth is, is that it time heals these kind of things. But the first thing that we have to do is get the other compounds or the other stuff out of our system that we're taking that might be affecting our sleep. And then, you know, getting into meditative practices, you know, staying in your breath. I mean, like a lot of times when I couldn't sleep, when I was going through my stuff was because I couldn't get my thoughts to stop. My mind would be running in all different directions. And this is where a, a daily meditative practice can help you. Because anytime that I ever catch my mind running at all anymore, which isn't anywhere near is what it used to be, but I always go back to my breath in through the nose, out through the mouth. And I catch myself and I just go back to being in the present moment. And maybe I have to repeat that a few times, but it's a learned practice, you know, and with consistency and repetition, things will get better. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, um, that's, you know, we, we've covered a lot of, of detail. Yeah. I was, you know, we, we haven't really touched on, uh, MDMA. And that sure. was one, one area that you said was really profound as well. And that's going to be a FDA approved in less than a year. Yeah. Um, for primarily addiction, they've never seen anything work so well for addiction. Correct. PTSD. What's that? Or PTSD. Yeah. Okay. PTSD, man. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's really impressive. And this is right around the corner. Um, but you had a profound experience with it as well. So, um, how, I guess, tell us a little bit about how it works. And, and um, what does it work best for? Is it people that are struggling with PTSD? Or can it help people with anxiety and depression? So like, here's my honest opinion with all of this stuff. I think that ketamine is the answer for PTSD. And I think it is for depression and anxiety as well. I love MDMA, like the compound. I think it has amazing potential to help tons of people. Um, but it's more of like, you're going to be like a talk therapy. Okay. Because mm -hmm. ketamine, I mean, MDMA isn't going to be sending you into these deep therapeutic, profound psychedelic experiences. It's really a heart opening drug, which like, helped me so yes. much in my life when yeah. I didn't even use it for therapeutic values. You know, it's like, listen, like I'd be hanging out with a bunch of friends and we would take a bunch of MDMA and we would sit around and we would just talk like mm -hmm. all night and like open our hearts and talk about things we normally wouldn't talk about. Yeah. Things that like haunted us in our own personal lives or resentments we were holding on, you know, the like something our parents did to us 20 years ago or something like that. And and the thing is that like, I think the potential in that aspect for it, um, I think it's going to do amazing things for couples therapy. Mm -hmm. I think that like, you know, if people are married and they're, you know, at the end of their ropes and their marriage looks like it's might not going to move forward or it could possibly end. I think if you give that couple MDMA and sit them in a room together and let them talk things out for a few hours he'll save the marriage yeah. you know and so it's like and listen i definitely think that it's going to do amazing things for ptsd because it already is mm -hmm. i know they're using it with veterans and law enforcement officers and clinical studies and they're having fantastic results with that um that being said though the one difference about like MDMA and ketamine is, is like ketamine is works on the NMDA receptors and dopamine in the brain actually creates more dopamine where when you take MDMA, it floods the brain with serotonin. Okay. Which makes you feel so euphoric and loving and amazing too. The only thing that I see like where this could be a little bit of a hiccup is like the day after you take it, there might be a little bit of a lag because you sure. really so much of it mm -hmm. and like that's why i think that ketamine is so important because it doesn't drain anything it actually helps you produce more but like 
different compounds for different people. Like, you know, like I'll, I'll definitely say that MDMA changed me to the core of who I truly was because it really gave me the ability to love other people. Like mm -hmm. a guy who didn't love myself for so many years and got to really like have those bonding experiences with people on MDMA. I think it's a beautiful compound and I think it does hold a lot of potential. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, that's great, man. Well, Charles, Charles Patty, he's the chief educational officer and ambas and brand ambassador for my self wellness, my self wellness dot center. C E N T E R is yep. the website. Yeah. My, my self wellness dot center, not com. No, dot center. Dot center. Yep. And, uh, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to take a chance, a second to plug our new clothing line for the warriors of consciousness. This is a nonprofit organization that we actually just started. Um, all profits from selling any of the clothing line or donations that we take are going to fund people that can't afford psychedelic academy and therapy. Uh, if you want to check that out, there's a link at www.woc fund f-u-n-d dot com and uh it's got or dot org i'm so sorry so w-o-c f-u-n-d dot org and there's a whole clothing line and all kinds of cool merchandise and you know kind of like this the mission statement be behind what we do what we're doing so yeah and we'll put all those links um in the at the end of the podcast so people can find you and they can find your center it's in bonito bonita springs florida yep. Yes. And uh, so um, and definitely, Charles, and man. Definitely, keep, definitely keep an eye out in the near future for more pop ups because uh, we're definitely going to be expanding. Yeah. Oh, and, and if you guys and, and, and if anybody wants to listen to our podcast, um, we have psychedelic radio and it's actually it's, it's uh, streamed through it's um, streamed on all major uh, streaming platforms and it's through cannabis radio. OK, awesome. You're on that. Yeah, uh, me, uh, Christina, and myself, we uh, we host it. We actually just had Dr. Rick Strassman on it. Uh, Dr. Albert Garcia from Johns Hopkins University, the one that I talked about, he was on it. Nice. Uh, and maybe we can have you on it in the future as well. Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing a deep dive. I'm learning. I so I appreciate it. it. Well, Charles, thanks so much for doing this, man. And a pleasure to meet you. All right. It's a pleasure to meet you as well. 